Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. He foretold this very thing. We were too fearful. Do not be afraid. I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Glory to God in heaven, now and forevermore. Please be seated. We just sang that Jesus entered the cross and grave, sinners to redeem and save. Jesus didn't come to congratulate the righteous people, if there were any. He came to help the poor and the downtrodden, so that, as he said, the poor will hear good news, the oppressed will go free, and the blind will see. Jesus came for us just as we are. And that's where we begin today as we pray together 
our prayer of confession. Let us pray. We have come to expect bad news, O God, so not much of it surprises us. We have grown numb to the evil and brutality that seems to wield so much influence in the world. What surprises us is good news. And to protect ourselves from hoping too much, like the disciples, we are sometimes slow to believe it. Overcome our reluctance, O oh God, and help us embrace the promise of resurrection. Open our hearts to the good news that nothing can separate us from your love, which has come to us through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Savior. On this day of resurrection, hear the good news. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. He himself bore our sins on the cross that we might be dead to sin and alive to all that's good. I declare to you in the name of Jesus Christ that you and I are forgiven. And so, friends in Christ, in response to this gift of God's grace, how then shall we live? With gratitude following after the Lord Jesus Christ, who calls us to love God with heart, soul, mind, and strength, and our neighbors as ourselves. This is the way of Jesus, in whom we find life.
choir sounded pretty good this morning, even though they're missing a couple of members. Uh, Cal Parks had uh, some surgery this past week. He's recuperating at uh, Glen Eyre. Uh, Nan Humphrey is not singing today, but she did make it to church. Son David brought her in following her uh, week-long stay at Rex. A couple others that uh, couldn't be with us this morning uh, in our beautiful new sanctuary, Sue Hayes and uh, Dot Hoover, among others that are recuperating at home. Let us come to God now in a time of prayer. Creator God, what a joy to be here this morning. For some of us just to live to see Easter morning in this divinely restored sanctuary again is a grand victory. There's some we wish could have made it to one more Easter service in here. But we take comfort once again in hearing the sure promises of eternal life with you. We know they are still in your hands as always. In the light of Easter morning, gracious God, we pray for those who are still living in darkness, be it the shadow of poverty or oppression, the storms of violence and war, or in the dim light of despair. May the good news get to them somehow that there is hope that you are still alive and with us, and one day your kingdom will come on the earth. On this day of resurrection, we pray, eternal God, for you to bring to completion your saving work so that the whole world may see the fallen lifted up, the old made new, and all things brought to perfection. Through the love and grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God forever and ever. And now, with these believers all gathered together in the light of Resurrection Day, we join our voices in praying as Jesus taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. had some trouble with my microphone in the past. Can you hear me? Oh. That be a no. <laughs> I said I've had trouble with my mic in the past. Can you hear me? <laughs> Good morning. Christ is risen. Oh. He's risen indeed. Very nice. <laughs> Someone was here at the Easter egg hunt. So I say, Christ is risen, and you say, he is risen indeed. So let's try it. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Oh, you know what? It's much more exciting than that. So let's get excited and loud. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. That wasn't very loud. Do you guys think that was very loud? That wasn't very loud. Christ is risen. He is risen. That was much better. Let's get some help. Christ is risen. 
Amen. This morning, some of you were at the egg hunt, and we learned from Dr. McLeod about the egg. The egg is a symbol of new birth, of new beginnings. And this week, we remember that Jesus took the road to his resurrection, but had the Last Supper with the disciples, then had a trial and was put to death, and then came back to life three days later, and we celebrate his resurrection in the day that is Easter today. And one symbol, there are many symbols, the cross, the lily, a butterfly, um, one symbol is the egg. And so um, that is one way that we are able to remember Easter. So I want you to think about that when you see the egg, not the Easter bunny, but Jesus and life and our life. So I have something for you. And let, I don't know if you remember this, but this is how I like to pass things out. And Oh, this went the wrong way. So here you go. Here you go. Here you go. Okay, everybody take one. Okay, so on here, you get to take it with you. Um, you will see, you don't need two, so pass up the extras. You will see a tomb. So Jesus was buried in the tomb. You'll see Jesus with the lights behind him showing his resurrection, that he's come back to life. You'll see the crosses. There's three of them. Jesus was in the middle with two other people, uh, two men, next, one next to, on his right and left. You'll see a woman, one of the women that found Jesus. Um, and don't take them off yet. You can do that when you get back. You'll see the stone that they rolled away that was in front of the tomb. You'll see an angel. There was an angel that told the women when they said, where have they taken my Lord? They were very upset because Jesus was supposed to be in the tomb. But the angel said, don't worry. Jesus has risen. Go find him. And there's some lilies. Remember I said Easter lilies. We remember Jesus. So this is for you to take and to have the, the story of Easter. Now we also have, some of you were able to do this and some of you weren't, have some eggs, some more eggs. Now what I like to think about is as you are coloring these eggs, if you are coloring them during worship, one way that you do that is you are calm, you don't need too many, make sure you have a couple. I don't need any of them back, but make sure you don't have too many and that everybody has at least one. Here's some blank ones. So, when you are color, okay, okay, everybody get some. When you're coloring them, I want you to be prayerful Back to me. I want you to be prayerful and thoughtful. I want you to think about God and quietly color. One way you can do that is pray and color. You can do that and be prayerful. So remember the egg and the symbolism of new life. You've got your pictures of the Easter story. So remember, it's not just about the candy. I, I'm not going to say it's not at all about the candy, because we all know it's sort of about the candy. But the main reason we are celebrating this is because, well, the whole reason we are celebrating this is because of Jesus Christ. But I know that you're also excited about the candy. But as you eat the candy, remember that Jesus Christ is risen. Christ is risen. That was good. Let's have a prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son and for the promise of new life and for the life of Christ and for his death and resurrection 
Help us to celebrate Easter every day, remembering all that you give us in the promise of Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Now, there's no children's worship, so you can go back to your seat quietly. Let us pray. O oh God, quicken us by your Holy Spirit so that your word as it is read and proclaimed may become real and alive in our hearts and minds. Amen. The first lesson is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. But on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they came to the tomb, taking the spices that they had prepared. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they went in, they did not find the body. While they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you when he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified, and on the third day rise again. Then they remembered his words, and returning from the tomb, they told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the other women with them who told this to the apostles. But these words seemed to them to be an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen cloths by themselves. Then he went home, amazed at what had happened. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our second reading is also taken from the New Testament, this from Paul's first letter to the Corinthian congregation at the end of the 15th chapter where we read one simple verse. Therefore, my beloved, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And again, let us pray. Lord God of grace and goodness, pour out your spirit upon us as we gather here this day. And as we gather ourselves around the good news of Easter morn, Give to us the gift of your spirit, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts will be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I hope I never have to use anything I've learned from watching these programs. But there is a particular genre of television show that if I see it as I'm blazing through the channels, as I am wont to do, this genre of television program will stop me in my tracks, and I can't not watch it. That was an intentional double negative. I can't not watch it. 
There are a few shows like this, and maybe you're familiar with them, shows with titles like Man vs. Wild. And they feature survival experts, people who are dropped in the middle of a jungle or a frozen tundra or a barren desert, and they show some of the tricks of the trade of survival. How to find food, how to build a shelter, how to protect yourself from predators, that sort of thing. But the common element in almost every show is they emphasize the critical importance of being able to build and maintain a fire. In some of these settings, a fire is absolutely critical as it provides warmth and light and protection and, of course, it enables you to cook whatever food you've been fortunate enough to hunt or trap or find. Now, I have to say, I was disheartened to learn recently that some of these shows are staged. I was the last one to figure that out, by the way. Maybe they all are. And that between takes, some of these survivalists are resting quite comfortably in their well-accommodated trailers or in nearby five-star hotels. But be that as it may, they were right about the fire. They were right about the need for maintaining fire in these precarious situations and that it's worth the effort to keep the fire going even when it might be small and faint and barely burning. For keeping the fire kindled against all odds can make all the difference out there in places where life is difficult and hostile and worse. And just so you know, by fire, I no longer mean just fire. Because as I've watched these shows, I've come to believe that these fledgling fires, they start out there in the most inhospitable places. I've come to believe that these fires are a good metaphor for our faith of our holding on to this deep faith in God, a life-sustaining faith in God, even when that faith is hard to sustain, even when it's hard to keep it going, even when our faith sometimes grows dangerously dim and is on the verge of withering away altogether. The survivalists would tell us that keeping that fire burning is of utmost importance, that our very survival might depend upon it. And I would say to you that tending to our faith is at least that important, that tending to that place within us where our lives are tethered to the promises of God. That believing, even when believing is hard, this is how we make it through our own journeys through the frozen, barren, lifeless, hopeless seasons of our own lives. Now holding on to faith when life is going well, when life is working out, and when there seems to be some moral order to the universe, holding on to faith then is easy. But then darkness invades. And evil rears its ugly head. Violence and brutality seems to have the run of the place. And our faith is tested, stretched, challenged, bent to the point of breaking. On our good days, we anchor our faith on promises like, in all things, God is at work for good. But on our bad days, we can't always see it. And because we believe God summons forth in us acts of compassion and sacrifice and love, we do try to act that way. But maybe you've noticed sometimes those who act out of sacrifice and compassion and love get run over by the forces of cruelty and evil and hatred. And so we wonder what's the point of trying to live a different way. Not long after the horrific shootings at Newtown, we all, I think, pondered the heroic sacrifices of those young teachers who tried everything they could to protect their children, but who were no match 
for a person who was bent on destruction. Now, if we based our view of the world on the events of that one awful morning, we might be left to assume that our good and noble acts are no match for the evil that seems to prevail. We might be left to assume that our faintly flickering candles are no match for the darkness that seems too often to drape the world in sorrow and that we are powerless to do anything about it. Worse yet, we might begin to wonder if God is able to do anything about it. And when we begin to ask that kind of question, and many of us do, our fire is at risk of going out. Which is why this day is of such vital importance. For this day, this is the day when we are given the only fuel our fire needs. For this is the day when we are reminded that God has confronted the powers of evil. That God has confronted the forces of darkness. God has gone to battle with the powers at work in the world that seek to steal our joy and our hope. That on the cross of Jesus Christ, God has faced the worst cruelty, the worst injustice, the worst evil inclinations of the human heart. God has faced all of that, endured all of that. And on this day, we celebrate the fact that none of these things will be victorious for long. For in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, God has shown that his way in the world will not be defeated. That his plans for the world will not be derailed. And that the shroud of death and darkness will not suffocate our capacity to hope. And that it's okay to trust in God. Because God is trustworthy. Sometimes it's hard to see that. When all of our best dreams are dying on a cross. But the truth is that the most important symbol of our faith is not a cross. The most important symbol of our faith is an empty tomb. If all we had was a cross, all we would be able to do is look back and think about the depth of God's love for us. And that would be great in and of itself. But it's the empty tomb. It's the empty tomb that allows us to look out into the future. And to trust that despite all evidence to the contrary, life is stronger than death. Light is stronger than death than darkness, that love is stronger than hatred, and that evil will not win, period. That is fuel for our fire. Knowing that, believing that, trusting that is what allows us to live in this precarious world with our lives anchored on God's promises. I don't know how people live in this world without that faith, without that sustaining faith and the strength and the encouragement it provides. I don't know how they do it. I just know I wouldn't want to try. Jenny and I went to the movies last weekend, and for the life of me this morning, I couldn't remember what we saw, but I do remember one of the trailers we saw of the movie soon to be released. And I saw that we're about to see yet another attempt to tell the Superman story. The enduring popularity of Superman tells us something about ourselves. We have this intuitive sense that we need some help. We have this intuitive sense that we need some help and it's going to take someone from beyond us. Someone who is not bound by the ways of the world to free us from the troubles of the world. And so we are drawn to Superman, who didn't look much like the world's best hope, by the way. 
He looked a lot like Clark Kent. But in him was the power that always resides on the side of goodness and fairness and decency. We are drawn to the story of Superman because we want to believe, we desperately want to believe that there is a power at work in the world that will set things right. We desperately want to believe that there is a force for good in a world where the tide seems to be going in the other direction. And no offense to Superman, but the church has been telling this story for a long time. Not as science fiction fantasy, but as gospel, as gospel truth. The gospel truth that there is hope for the world, for us, and that the thing we most want to believe, we can believe. Because Christ is risen. But if I can stretch this Easter sermon out just a little bit more, what I really want you to do just for a moment is to ponder the wonderful thing Paul tells us at the end of the 15th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Where at the end of a chapter, he's given, if you read the whole chapter, you'll see that he gives this long, complicated explanation of the resurrection and its central importance to us. And then right at the end, in the one verse we read, he says this. Therefore, and I've told you before, you always need to pay attention to what happens after the therefore. Therefore, my beloved, he says, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the work of the Lord, because you know that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Here, Paul is telling us that it's worth the risk to be noble and kind and courageous and good and decent and caring, all the things that Jesus invites us to be, despite the fact that living that way doesn't always get rewarded in this world. And it sometimes seems that the good we do, we do in vain. But here, Paul says, because of the resurrection, your labor is not in vain. For here, Paul tells us, the very fact of the resurrection tells us that the things we do in the name of Christ will never be in vain. We may not see the direct result of the good we do. We might never see an immediate benefit. We may be like the person who plants the oak tree and never gets to sit under the shade. We may never see an immediate result of the good, faithful, sacrificial, generous things we do. On the day of that Newtown shooting, those courageous teachers tried to shield their children. But they died in the process. And one way of looking at that is that their attempts were futile. But the gospel way of looking at that is their labors were not in vain. Because the resurrection of Jesus is the eternal validation of the way of Jesus. I'm going to say that again. The resurrection of Jesus is the eternal validation of the way of Jesus. Which means that God takes every act of loving sacrifice, every expression of Christ-like compassion, the God, God takes all the good we do, and in ways we won't be able to see or understand, God uses those expressions of sacrifice and compassion and kindness. God uses those things to bring wholeness and health and renewal to the world. So Easter is not just about giving me hope about my eternal life. It also reminds us that to share in the work of Jesus in the world is making a difference in the world, whether we can see it or not. That to share in the work of Jesus in the world is to be a part of the eternal plan of redemption and renewal. While the world keeps waiting for Superman, 
to set things right. We believe that things have already been set right and that the resurrection of Jesus is what fuels that belief. For while death and darkness and injustice and cruelty and hatred still roam the streets trying to inflict their harm on us, we believe they have been defeated for all time by the death and resurrection of Jesus. And believing that is what gives us the courage to continue the work of Jesus because we know our labor is not in vain. I invite you to remember the words of one of my favorite hymns. For though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. It was never more clear in the whole history of the world that God was in charge than on the day of resurrection. Put simply, what we learned on that day is that God's way will prevail, even when it doesn't look like it will. And that Jesus' way is the way to be a human being. And that it will not be defeated by those who think life is to be lived another way. So for those of us who are trying to follow him, and who find it difficult, and who doesn't. This is the day that gives us the resolve to stay on the path of discipleship. This is the day when we learn for sure that God was at work in Jesus in a way that God has never been at work in a human life before. And so perhaps our prayer this day should be that God might be at work in us in some small way to bring a bit of light and hope and joy to a world that needs it so much. To God be the glory, now and forever. Amen.
And now with disciples over the century, let us stand and say together the traditional words of the Apostles' Creed. Let us affirm what we believe. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We just sang, give thanks to the risen Lord. How do we do that? Well, by our presence, by the work of our hands, and by giving to God some of what God has given us to give, to do God's work. Let us present to God our tithes and offerings.
Let us pray. Dear God, as Ed reminded us, your plans will not be derailed. Guide us to use these gifts, these tools for ministry according to your plan. Lord, our prayer is that you be at work in us as we seek to serve Christ from the heart of the city to the ends of the world with love, faith, and action. Amen. For though the wrong seems oft so strong, God is the ruler yet. How do we know this? We know this because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Or we can see if you learned anything from the children today. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And now may grace, mercy, and peace the triune blessing of a triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, be with you to abide with you and with those you love and with God's people everywhere now and forevermore. Amen.